بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا so first of all I just want to make something very clear you know when when Sheikh Abdul Nasser was talking about the importance of the parents and uh, you know in, the, in that very moving talk you know sometimes when we talk about like the Salaf and the stories of the people that came before and uh, you know there was Imam Ahmed rahimahullah who didn't get married until his mom passed away who refused to get married till his mom passed away or you find you know Zainul Abidin rahimahullah wouldn't eat from a plate until his mother ate from a plate and those types of things you know there are people even today uh, that still hold their parents in that same regard um, how many of you ever heard of Sheikh Muhammad Mukhtar Shanqiti He's the son of the former Mufti Muhammad Amin Shanqiti. Uh, very famous scholar in Medina. You know, he didn't get married till his 40s because he applied the same thing as Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah, where he said, I'd wait, I would not be able to fulfill my rights towards her uh, if I'm married. And that's, it's, it's not Sunnah, you don't have to wait. But subhanAllah, he just felt that same, that same sense of burden that he did not get married until his mother passed away. Also, how many of you have heard of Sheikh Sa'ad al-Ghamdi? You know Sheikh Sa'ad al-Ghamdi has been approached by the Saudi government to become the Imam of the Haram twice, but he refused both times because his parents live in Dammam and his parents wanted him to stay close to him. SubhanAllah, we, we still find even today some of you know, these scholars and great personalities that truly put their parents above all. And that's really the meaning of this hadith. It's not just any typical hadith about the rights of parents. It's again, putting them before everything else. Now compare that to you know, our, our, our day and age or where we are today and what we see happening in our communities where someone wants to get married and they're willing to sacrifice the relationship of 20, 25 years because of a person that they met two months ago at an MSA. And I'm willing to forget about all of that because I want to marry that person. And that's it. Now I'm not saying that sometimes the parents are, unjustif are not unjustified uh, or are unjustified whenever they, uh, whenever they stop a person from getting married. But the point is again, you know, just the, the complete lack of respect lack of understanding, lack of appreciation is sometimes really disturbing and subhanAllah it, it ties into all of these situations and the beauty of this hadith is that all three of these situations tie, are tied in with one another. This, the second situation which is the one I'm going to cover, how many of you are going to college next year? Sisters, mashallah, how many of you are already in college? How many of you live alone? Not many of you. How many of you plan on living alone? I forgot you're Daisy. You guys stay living with each other forever. You get married and you just bring the wife into the house too. You know, I know how it goes. But anyway, in essence, this concept of being alone, being unmonitored, finally having some privacy, finally having some freedom. And what we realize sometimes when we go off to college, when, we're, when, we, go to, when we go to our schools and where we're no longer under the eye of our parents, what we realize sometimes is that when we were growing up, we really didn't have taqwa of Allah we kind of had taqwa of our parents. But we didn't have taqwa of Allah. Because it exposes you because now all of a sudden you're alone. All of a sudden you have the chance to, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of a sudden you are your own man, you are your own woman. And all of these temptations start hitting you from the right and from the left, from behind you and from in front of you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes either your true taqwa or your lack thereof. And this hadith, by the way, by the way, why were these three men in the cave in the first place? Did you guys talk about that? Okay. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah, he says that there was a storm. There was a storm. So it's not like these three guys just went to a cave and started, you know, having a bonfire or something like that and started talking. There was a storm that forced these three men into a cave to shelter themselves from the storm. And during that storm, the, the stone had moved, the rock or the boulder had moved to shut the cave. And that's when they started to make this deal to invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their good deeds. Now what you'll notice about this situation, the second situation, it's unlike the first one. Why? Was the first situation about a man who did a good deed or was it about a man who left to sin? 
a person who did a good deed. Okay, he did a good deed for his parents. This person that I'm talking about right now is someone who did not do a good deed. He just happened to leave a sin. But he considered it a good deed. He considered it a good deed and so did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because when he made the dua, the boulder did move. So that was a sign of acceptance of that. And as we, uh, as we read, this second person, Rasulullah says, he said, Oh Allah, I had a cousin who was the dearest of all people to me. And I wanted to have intercourse with her, but she refused. Later she came across hard times during a year of famine. And she came to me and I gave her 120 dinars on the condition that she would not resist my desires. And she agreed. When I was about to fulfill my desires, and by the way, just for this, it's important to, to sort of show you the depth of the situation. The, the explanation of this hadith is when he says I was about to, it's not that he was talking to her, that he was starting. No, they were already engaged in the act and he was about to take it to the next level. He was about to take it to the next level. So they were already laying together. Just to show you again how intense this was, at that moment, at that moment she said to me, it is illegal for you to violate my chastity except through marriage, ex except through the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it permissible. He said, so I realized it was a sin and I left her and I even had some gold with me that I left for her. So, so the 120 dinars and the gold, I left it all over there and I went away understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forbidden this. And then he made that dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, if you know that this was done for your sake, please relieve us from this present uh, calamity. So anyway, we get to the situation. Number one, and there are many things to break down from this hadith. If you're not taking notes, then you have a problem. So number one, the fact that this person said twice in the hadith, وَهِيَ أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَيَّ she was the most beloved person to me. So this was not just some crush that he developed overnight. This was not just someone that he found attractive. This was someone that he developed feelings for. He says this in the beginning and he says this in the end. To emphasize, I actually had feelings for her. She was the most beloved person to me. This was not someone that just caught me at one night. I was developing my feelings for her. We were getting closer to each other. And I still left it for your sake, O oh Allah. Many times what happens in these situations, again, we go off and we have some privacy. We start developing a relationship, sometimes subconsciously. Sometimes it comes through an MSA, through an organization, through YM, maybe whatever it is. And we start sending Facebook messages to each other and we start adding those little smiley faces all the time. And you know, we start on, we start saying different things. We start becoming a little bit more flirtatious. We start laughing a little bit more with each other. We start developing feelings for each other. And it's kind of understood that, you know what, I'm going to marry you and you're going to marry me. Now the problem with all of that is that you start talking. And you're still, you know, you're still convincing yourself, or rather shaitan is telling you, look, you're not doing anything wrong, alhamdulillah, you didn't do this. And then when you do that, then shaitan says, well, it could have been a lot worse, alhamdulillah, you didn't do that. So, you know, you start talking, you start meeting in public, maybe with a group of friends, then you start meeting alone, then you start tapping each other on the shoulder, then you start maybe, you know, touching a little bit, but you're not getting completely intimate. Then you go to the parents. You see the problem with the equation here? Then you go to the parents and you act like nothing ever happened. And then the daughter says, Dad, you know, this guy wants to marry me. What do you think? And he says, I don't like him. He's not Hyderabadi. Or I don't like him. He's not from Palestine. Or he's not from Karachi. Or he's not this. He's not that. Or I don't like him. He hasn't finished enough of his education. Then the tragedy starts from there. But wait a minute. I love him. I can't let him go. What do you mean? Is that all? Isn't that hadith about the wali? Uh, can I find something in the Hanafi fiqh that says I don't need a wali? How can I get around my parents now? Let me find an imam who's going to do this marriage. Let me, let me see how I can get around this now. You start creating your own fiqh and customizing your relationship with Allah to conform with a haram relationship that you already established with someone else. And then you want to say Islam is not fair. 
Why does Islam say that the parents have this authority? Why does Islam say this? Why does Islam say that? Why, why is this happening to me? But I love him. I love her. I can't let it go. You shouldn't have developed the relationship in the first place. If the equation was proper, then you wouldn't have found yourself in the dilemma that you're in. And then you say, but I can't live without her. I can't live without him. It's your fault. You started it. You developed, you allowed yourself to develop that relationship. So now for the sake of saving your other relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the second most important relationship with your parents, you need to sacrifice the one that is, that is, that is grabbing your heart at that moment. So he allowed himself to develop feelings for her. And he didn't stop it at its root. Now, is it permissible in Islam to marry your cousin? I know it's gross and disgusting in America because we're Americans and we see it as weird. But is it permissible? Yes. So could he have approached this the right way? Yes, but he didn't. He allowed the feelings to develop. He kept getting close to her. And in particular, what do you think allowed those feelings to develop more? The fact that she was his cousin. Right? Let me tell you what happens in some Muslim countries, and even here, but even in some Muslim countries, because we always, we're always told about how bad we are as American Muslims. In some Muslim countries, female cousins will not wear hijab, even if they are, they are regular mutahajabat in front of their male cousins. This is extremely common. So the, and, and it's not just the cloth, but the whole, you know, the rules of modesty, the rules that govern hijab, the situation in the state of hijab. When it comes to cousins, it's not there. It's not there. So, you know, it, even though it's permissible, people, you know, and this person is just as strange to me as any stranger on the outside. From an Islamic standpoint, that person is supposed to observe just as much hijab in front of you as they are in front of any other man on the street. But she's my cousin. He's my cousin. So you start developing feelings. You start getting close to each other. Oh, you're, you're just like my sister. And then you've got the whole brother-in-law and sister-in-law thing. And this is crucial. By the way, this is not racism at all. And if you're Desi, I, I, I consider myself half Desi because I was in a Desi community for six years. I can't even eat Arab food anymore. So don't take any offense to this. But this culture, this culture of moving the wife in, when I've got a brother who's the same, who's close to my age, and who's going to interact with her without her hijab and without any bounds whatsoever, is a destructive culture. It's so much so that the Prophet ﷺ said, Alham huwa al maut. The brother in law is death. Can you imagine that statement? The brother in law is death. That doesn't mean you should hate your brother in law. That doesn't mean you should hate your brother in law. But it's easy to assume, well, he's like my brother now. You know, husband and wife start talking, she's like my sister. He's like my brother in now. And then you start establishing a relationship with each other, you start, you start being more friendly with each other, the hijab becomes lax in front of the brother-in-law now. If it's not the clothing of hijab, just the barriers are, are, are blurred there. I've seen people that are, that are considered to be extremely religious, right? They'll pose for pictures with their female cousins, they'll pose for pictures with their sister-in-law, it's, it's whatever. She's my sister. He's my brother. And Rasulullah said, no, he's death. Why? Because you know how many times, I'm telling you as Imam, when I was Imam in New Orleans, Wallahi, how many times I had a situation where a brother-in-law was at home alone with his sister-in-law, with his own brother's wife, and then one day groped her. But they decided to save face in the family not to tell anybody. But the, but the girl was distraught forever. Just a few weeks ago, when I was visiting a community, a girl in full hijab and full jilbab, and I'm talking about her hijab comes down to her wrists. She was telling me that her, her male cousin, her male cousin took her to school. She's in high school. He always used to take her to school. And all of a sudden he pulled the call, car over, and this is a masjid goer, and she's a masjid goer, religious family. All of a sudden he pulled the call, ca a car over and started to make a move on her. But she didn't tell anybody because he threatened her. He said, if you tell anyone, I'm going to tell, you know, I'm going to tell your dad that you did this and this and this and that. It'll be my word against yours. Shaitan starts to play in those times. But you know how many times whenever the hijab gets blurred, 
you stop understanding or you stop abiding by the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah allows you to fall into destruction. You destroy yourselves. Everything in the sharia is for our own good. Everything in the sharia is for our own good. Oh, she's like my cousin. She's like my sister, man. She's not my cousin. You know, that, I would never think about marrying her anyway. I would never think about anything like that. And, you know, even, again, the brother-in-law, the sister-in-law, all of that, it all gets blurred, and that's a problem. That's a problem. When you read in the classical books of fiqh, even brother and sister are supposed to observe certain limits with each other. I'm not saying she has to wear hijab in front of her brother. Absolutely not. But even brother and sister are not supposed to get too comfortable. Not supposed to be in the same bed. You know, even if it's just whatever. They're not, she's not supposed to dress indecently in front of him. Right, the way that they hug, the way there you would actually find instructions, the way that they hug should not be the way that a husband would hug his wife or a son would hug his mother. Because even that can get bad. But of course, this is something where you have a situation with non mahrams, people that are actually prohibited for you, but you allow yourself to develop a close relationship with them because the culture does not consider them to be non mahram. So that's the first thing. Understand the bounds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for you. The other thing, whenever you're developing that feeling, don't allow yourself to be alone, al khalwa. Don't allow yourself to be alone with that person. Whether it's physically or whether it's virtually. Cyber khalwa, chatting, emails, text messages, whatever it is, don't allow yourself to be alone. And the scholars say, if you have feelings for that person, then don't allow yourself to be in their company even if there is no khalwa whatsoever. Even if, even if there is no seclusion, because it's dangerous for you at that point, so you need, to, you need to exercise some boundaries. You need to separate yourself from the situation because you are developing, you're developing feelings for that person now. Another thing, and this was something that Personally, one of my one of my scholars, Sheikh Omar Al Ashqar, Hafizahullah, I remember back in, in one of the conferences, and I was a kid, so but it was the Maya conference. They used to have the Muslim Arab youth of America. And they used to bring all before before America used to, you know, not allow scholars to come here, uh, used to have serious ulama coming from all over the world to this country, having major conferences that couldn't be held anywhere in the Muslim world. And there was once a qarar, there was once a, a, a decision from the scholars of Maya that a young man, because obviously they were addressing a group of immigrants, young men that were coming here to start their lives, and they were college students, that no young man should live alone. Either he gets married, or he gets a roommate. Because once you're alone, shaitan can start playing games with you. It starts to open the doors for things. Some of the scholars, and I'm not even going to say their names because they're banned now, some of the scholars went so far to say that it was haram. That it would be haram in the situation that we are in now. Because so many youth were coming from the Muslim world and they were in a, in a strict situation. All of a sudden now, they had this free world and all of a sudden they were opening themselves up to so many different forms of haram. They destroyed themselves. So the point is, don't allow yourself to be in, in close contact with that person. But the heart of all of this, the heart of all of this is the concept of muraqaba. The concept of being watched, of being observed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is observing you as Imam ibn Qudama rahimahullah said, Anta turaqibullah, wallahu yuraqibuk. You are observing Allah and Allah is observing you. You're observing His presence by worshipping Him as if you can see Him and He sees you. So you are observing Him and He's observing you. All of a sudden Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a cover for you. Allah created a cover for you. All of a sudden now, you're off to school. You're independent. You've got your own car. Your parents are not giving you curfews. You have your own time alone. You can be with certain people. You can do certain things that were off limits. And shaitan wants you to experiment. It's only natural. He wants you to experiment. But at that moment, you need to make sure that you're observant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is watching you because the peak of hypocrisy the peak of hypocrisy and the worst of, pe the worst of people in the sight of Allah as the Prophet ﷺ said is Dhul Wajhain, one who is two-faced. 
One who is two-faced. Not two-faced in the sense that he tells you one thing and he goes to another person and says another thing. That you're a totally different person. Literally, you have two faces. You have one with your parents and one outside. You have one with the masjid and one for school. Now we have multiple faces. Multiple faces. Through social networking, mashallah. Multiple faces. You could create five different profiles for yourself. Okay, and subhanAllah, you could portray yourself as something that you are totally not. But that shows that you're no longer observing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the scholars, um, uh, Imam al Qudam rahimahullah, narrates that one of the salaf, he said that my father taught me that every night before I go to sleep, so he kept on increasing this for me, he told me to say, Allahu ma'i, Allahu shahidi, Allahu nadirun ilayhi. That my father kept on telling me every night before I go to sleep to say, Allah is with me, Allah is witnessing me, Allah sees me. He was implanting in me this concept of muraqaba. And he would tell me every single night to say it more and more and more and more until I tasted the sweetness of that. Till I understood Allah is with me, Allahu ma'i, Allahu shahdi, Allah is watching me, Allahu nadirun ilayhi, Allah is. Is, uh, is Allah is witnessing me and then Allah is watching me. Until I tasted the sweetness of that. Till I understood. When Allah creates you that cover. You know, one of the scholars, one of the poets, he said, فَإِذَا خَلَوْتَ فِي رِيبَةٍ وَالنَّفْسُ دَاعِيَةً إِلَى تُغْيَانٍ And then whenever you find yourself under a cover, and the soul, the self starts to call you to rebellion, then remind yourself, yarani. The one who created darkness, the one who created the cover that's on me right now, sees me right now. The one who created that for me in the first place. I had youth that would, that would be in the masjid whenever they're trying to get into med school. Making dua, I'm telling you, doing i'tikaf in the masjid that they pass their MCATs, that they're gonna get into this med school. Once they got to med school, they started dating, they started establishing relationships. Their parents sent them off, mashallah, now they're in the dorm. And for another time, uh, this is whenever I go off on the parents for expecting their kids to remain pure until the age of 28, 30 years old without getting into any relationship in this country, which I think is absurd and ridiculous. So if you're a parent, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your children. But it doesn't absolve the children of the responsibility. You'll get punished too if you still do it. It's just a greater test for you. Allah created a cover for you. Allah gave you a blessing of going to school. Allah gave you a blessing of having a social life. And then you use that cover that Allah gave you. You use that blessing that Allah gave you to disobey Him. So remind yourself, the one who created this cover for me in the first place, He sees me right now. So it's not about who else sees me. I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me. I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave me, if I have beauty, Allah who gave me this beauty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me at this point. Also remember the jealousy of Allah, the honor of Allah. Now I know this one's going to sound really, really weird to you all, but it's very important. Jealousy always ha has a negative connotation in the English language. It doesn't always have a negative connotation in the Arabic language. Al-ghira. Al-ghira. It's more of honor and dignity. Because jealousy means you accuse an innocent person in English, right? And those, if any of you take the behind the scenes class, I go into a long discussion about this. The ghira of Allah. The ghira of Allah. Sa'id ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu one time, or maybe it was Sa'id ibn Wa'ad, I forgot which Sa'id it was, but he was telling the Sahaba, he said, if I ever caught my wife in the act of zina, I would kill her and I would kill the guy with the sharpest part of the sword. So the Sahaba came to the Prophet and they were like, this is a little too much, isn't it? And the Prophet ﷺ said, أَتَعْجَبُونَ بِغِيرَةِ سَعَدْ Are you amazed? Are you impressed by the honor of Sa'ad? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, it's too much. And he said, Wallahi, لَأَنَا أَغْيَرُ min. I have more ghira than him. Wallahu أَغْيَرُ minni, And Allah has more ghira than me. You know how in all the Hollywood movies, you're always, you know, they always got the girl that's being chased that has the big scary father that keeps a gun. Or what was that movie, what was that movie called with, uh, I hated that movie. What was it, Meet the Parents, right? That was a little psychotic and overboard. I only watched the first one. 
But, uh, you know, that whole concept of the scary dad, the dad that's going to try to kill you, it, it, you know, it, it sort of creates the, the, the rabbit, you know, the rabbit hunter. It sort of creates that chase, right, that pursuit. And guys like that, you know, running after the girl, trying to get around the big scary father. Well, obviously, in college and in, in school when, or whenever you're alone, you start establishing these relationships. It's not in the presence of the father. Now you act with more adab, you act with more dignity, you're a little bit more scared. Let's say if I told you, guys, specifically guys, that the girl that you're trying to mess with right now, her dad owns 20 guns, and he's a former Marine, and he has a, formal, uh, he has a former conviction, or he killed somebody before. I don't care how pretty the girl is, you're going to watch yourself. You're going to be like, no, I'm okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Astaghfirullah. You will become, you'll be, you will look at your shoes and you'll be like, oh, I didn't realize my shoes had some blue on them. All of a sudden, you're going to start lowering your gaze. You're going to be scared. Now, what is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, even if a woman has no man who has ghira of her, Allah has more ghira than any other man. And Allah doesn't just own 20 guns, Allah owns hellfire. So you better be careful. You're overstepping your bounds. Sisters, the same thing happens too, because you know what happens with a really jealous dad? He kills you and he kills the guy. So you are offending Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever you, whenever you make yourself promiscuous or whenever you open yourself up to that relationship. Even if they don't have a man who's going to be a real man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has more ghira than any man we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. And that's why Imam Ibn Sirin rahimahullah, he said, I used to see a woman in my dream. And I know that she was not halal for me. Now, here's the thing. In your dream, I'm, I'm going to give you guys a shimmer of hope. If you see something in your dream, it's okay. That doesn't mean that you can sit there before you sleep and try to think about somebody until you can dream about her. Or sisters, you can't do the same thing. All right? You can't just sit there and dream about the guy until you think of him and then you have a dream or whatever it is about that person. But if you have a dream about a person, you don't have to lower your gaze in your dream. Enjoy your dream, okay? Enjoy it. You don't have to lower your gaze. And you probably won't because you're in a dream anyway. You're not thinking about halal and haram and those types of things in that situation. But Imam Ibn Sirin, rahimahullah, he says that I used to see a woman in my dream وَأَعْلَمُ أَنَّهَا لَا تُحِلُّ لِي And I know that she's not halal for me فَأَصْرِفُ بَصَرِي so I lower my gaze. I would take my gaze away from her. Even in my dream, subhanAllah, you develop that strong sense of Allah is watching me right now. I'm shy. I'm ashamed. I'm shy. I'm ashamed. I'm scared. If you need to make yourself fear Allah more and think of hellfire more, think of hellfire more. I am scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of offending Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of going over the boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created uh, for me. And Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he says something very powerful. He says that, and, and this, he says, you know, he gives us this scenario. Again, Allah creates for you a cover. This man is alone with her now. He has the full opportunity to do what he has to do. And Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he said that a thief, whenever he's robbing a house, and he hears the doorknob rattle, or he hears the door starting to open, what does he do? He runs and he hides. He runs and he hides. Okay? And he says, at that moment, the thief went from committing an action of theft to committing an act of shirk. He didn't become a kafir. He committed an act of disbelief. Why? Because Allah was watching him the whole time and he only got scared when the doorknob started to rattle. That's when you know you're being a complete hypocrite. When you're on your computer and then when you think someone's coming close by, you need to start minimizing your windows. That's when you know something is wrong. When you're afraid of the gaze and you're afraid of the, the sight of people. You're afraid of other people seeing you. Allah was watching you the whole time and that kills your heart. What's worse, a public sin or a private sin? What's worse? A public sin, right? Rasulullah said that Allah would forgive a person on the day of judgment, a believer for everything except for the sins that he made public, that he boasted about. Why? Because you're proud of it. You're proud of it. It's, it's a shaitani type of, of attribute. 
satanic, right? You go out there and you tell people, hey, you know what I did last night? Or I was talking to this girl and I was talking to this. And it's satani. It's satanic in its nature. But the scholars of Teskia, they say that the ones that kill the heart more and that hinder your spiritual progress more are the secret sins. And that's why Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said in the very famous poem, إِذَا مَا قَالَ لِي رَبِّي أَمَسْتَحْيَيْتَ تَعْصِينِي وَتُخْفِ الذَّنْبَ عَنْ خَلْقِي وَبِالْعِصْيَانِ تَأْتِينِي I'm afraid that my Lord will tell me on the day of judgment, weren't you ashamed of disobeying me? And hiding the sin from my creation, my lowly creation, and with your disobedience coming to me, flaunting to me. It hinders your spiritual progress more. Why? Because it increases your two-facedness. It increases your hypocrisy. It kills the sense of muraqaba. You purposely try to ignore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember when John Edwards did what he did and he got caught. He did what he did many times, and, but then when he got caught, I remember Newsweek or Time magazine did, a, did an, uh, a, a paper or did an, um, an edition on the psychology of a cheater. The psychology of a cheater. And in essence, when a person is cheating on his wife, or when a person is trying to cheat on whatever it is, when a person is trying to have an affair, what do they do? They try to ignore every portion of reality that they possibly can. Think about it. When a person's cheating, they don't sit there and take out their phone and say, Hey, check out this picture of my kids. Yeah, she's too. She's pretty, isn't she? And if, if his wife calls, he's not going to answer the phone and just talk normally. What's that person going to do? He's going to turn his cell phone off. He's going to hide his wallet. He's going to hide the pictures of his kids. He's going to try to ignore the consequences of his actions. He's going to try to ignore reality. So in essence, whenever we cheat on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do the same thing. We try to ignore the circumstances. We try to ignore the consequences of the sin. We try to ignore reality. We try to pretend He's not there. If I close my eyes enough, maybe I can pretend He's not there. But He's there. And He's watching you. And He created that cover for you. And He knows what you're doing under that cover. And it's more offensive to him subhanahu wa ta'ala when you have the audacity to sin with that major sin, with that great sin, just because his lowly creation is not watching you at that moment. When you go off and you find your time alone, when you're on your computer and you have your time alone, when you're on your phone and you have your time alone, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what all of your text messages look like. And even if you delete your cookies and your history online, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what they were. You're not fooling Allah. You're not fooling Allah. The last thing that I want to come to, I want to end it on a positive note because all of you look scared right now. <laughs> I want to end it on a positive note. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded this person who was in the act of committing zina. And had there not been children in here, I would be a little bit more explicit as the scholars of hadith were, but I won't. But he was right there, he was in the process, and he held himself at that moment and he left that act. For that you get rewarded? Think about that. Think about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that you get rewarded? Right, and then we look at the famous hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he says that if a person makes a good intention, and follows it up with a good action, then how many times is he rewarded? He's ten times. Al Hasnatu Ba'ashri Amthariha. Ten times the reward. So Allah multiplies the good deed. If he makes a good intention but he doesn't fulfill it with he doesn't follow it up with action, what does Allah give him? He still gives him a good deed. I meant well, you had a good intention, Allah writes down for you the good deed as if you performed it. As if you did the good deed, Allah just won't multiply it for you. If a person sins and he follows it, if a person has the intention of doing something bad and he does the bad, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write for him? Just one sin. If a person has the intention to sin but doesn't follow it up with an act of sin, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write for him? See, some of you said nothing. Allah writes for him a good deed. How crazy is that? SubhanAllah. And I mean crazy and like awesome crazy. I don't mean crazy like in Junoon. I mean cra like wow. Human beings can't even fathom that. Right? That's like somebody coming to your house with a baseball bat 
about to bust up your car. I don't know if any of you know Britney Spears or if you had some relationship with her in the past, but apparently she likes to beat up cars with a baseball bat. So anyway, she shows up to your house, or not she, let's say a person shows up to your house with a baseball bat, is about to bust up your car, and then says, you know what, no. And then goes and knocks on the door, says, hey Muhammad, you know, I just wanted to let you know. I was, almost, I was really upset about the conversation we had last night, about all that trash talk about the 76ers and the Celtics, so I decided to come to your house and bust up your car, but I'm sorry. Now Muhammad, if he's a good guy, he just says, okay. Um, Salaam alaikum. Closes the door. If he's a good guy. If he's a normal guy, he calls the police and says, there's a guy with a baseball bat on my premises that came to bust up my car. But if he's a muhsin, if he's one who excels, well, actually, that's not even, that's, that's, even human ihsan doesn't fathom this, doesn't, you know, doesn't encompass this. You imagine if Muhammad says, oh, man, that's okay. Here, how much gas did you spend coming here? Let me pay you for the gas. And you know, how much did you buy that baseball bat for? I'll buy your bat too. I'm like, whoa, thanks, man. That's if, that's not even human, right? But that's Allah. It's not human, but that's Allah. Allah would actually give you a good deed because you were about to do something offensive to Him. You were engaging in the sin. And then you held yourself and you stopped. Allah gives you a good deed for that. SubhanAllah. And that's why on the Day of Judgment, one of the men, in the, in, one of the people in the category of those who are shaded by the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day when there is no other shade, amongst a, a just ruler, right? Imagine a just ruler, someone who grew up in the masjid, attached to the masjid. Amongst this high category of people, you have a person, رَجُلٌ دَعَتُ إِمْرَأَ ذَاتَ حَسَبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ A person who was approached by a woman of status and beauty, and it applies to sisters too, not with sisters, but with brothers, okay? And said, I fear Allah. I'm afraid of Allah. I'm afraid of Allah. I fear Allah. Not إِنِّي أَتَّقُ اللَّهِ No, sometimes you need to scare yourself. You need to remember that Allah owns hellfire. That I'm offending the one who holds my destiny in his hands and can put me in hellfire. I fear Allah. I'm holding myself back. And for that, Allah gave him that elite company. The company of the shuhada, the martyrs, and the siddiqun, and the truthful, and the prophets. Allah gave him that status and that honor because he held himself back. He stopped. Now obviously you don't want to put yourself in a situation, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're going to get anywhere close to zina. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina." Don't come close to it. Don't get yourself started. You know, don't, don't ruin yourself. Don't get yourself in the relationship and then try to go to your parents and try to make it all halal and try to make people kick it under the rug. Allah is going to get you. Allah is going to get you if you offend Allah. Allah will get you unless you repent. And the only way to sincerely repent is to leave it. But what if you're already engaged in a relationship? What if you've already put yourself in that danger zone? What do you do? And I'm going to end on this one story. And this is in the tafsir of Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah of Surah Al-A'raf verse number 201. Verse number 201 of Surah Al-A'raf. And Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah titles this, Shabun Yatahaddath Min Al Qabr, a young man who spoke from his grave. And Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah he narrates that there was a young man, Mulazim al Masjid, who was always in the Masjid, Min Tullab Amir al Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al Khattab, from the students of none other than Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He used to sit in all of the halaqat. He used to keep the company of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And his father was a shaykh. And when they say his father was a shaykh, meaning he was an old man. Not a shaykh as in a scholar, an old man. An old man. But subhanAllah. And, so, and, and the reason why these narrations would make it a point to mention that is because you know, he was a person that had a level of independence. His father was dependent on him. So he was a talib ilm, he was a student of knowledge, he had the presence of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he, you know, he was always in the masjid, and then one day on his way home, 
there was a woman that was calling him to her home. She was a beautiful woman. And he fell for it. And that shows you, by the way, just because you're religious doesn't mean that you're not going to fall for these things sometimes. You might fall for them. It's not about if you fall for them, or it's not about how you fall for them, or if you fall for them. It's about how quickly you get yourself out of the situation. So he followed her to her home. As he walked behind her, as she invited him into her home, as he walked behind her, تَذَكَّرَ قَوْلَ اللَّهِ He remembered the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is the ayah number 201 of Surah Al-A'raf. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ those who truly are conscious of their Lord. If they are tempted by a little touch of the shaitan. And again, it shows you that you're never absolved. Don't feel bad if you fell for this once or twice. Don't feel bad. It's about how you get yourself out right now. I know some of you are in these relationships right now. Religious or non-religious. Shaitan got you. He touched you. He tempted you. He got you for a moment. He staggered you. He got you off your feet. And he was following this woman to her house and he remembered this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, At that moment, تَذَكَّرُوا They remember Allah. فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ So now all of a sudden they can see. You know, Basr and Basira are two different things. Basr, he can see right now, but he can't see. He doesn't understand what's... He's not really seeing. Like some of you are looking at me right now, but you have no idea what I'm talking about. And some of you are extracting things from the words that I'm saying that even I can't extract. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that sometimes the listener gains more or understands something more than the speaker. Some of you, because of your basira, because of your attentiveness, because your insight, you're getting things from this lecture that even I'm not getting. So Allah subhanahu wa says, فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ So he's following along, then all of a sudden, what am I doing? Astaghfirullah. He passed out. He passed out. And the woman shut the door on him and she left him sleeping in front of her door. He woke up and he started to cry and he went to his father. And he told his father what he did. And his father said, and he was crying when he was talking to his dad. He said, I can't believe I did this. And he was shivering out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't do it. He just was about to do it. But he caught himself. And his father said to him, Ya Bunay, oh my son, what did you say? You know, that made you stop. And he recited the ayah again to his father, and then he fell and he died. He fell and he died. And this was a student of Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So Umar bin al-Khattab understood what happened. Umar bin al-Khattab knew what happened. And they prayed janaz on him that night, and Umar bin al-Khattab went and he sat next to him. While the, people were, while the people were there, after the janazah, after they buried him. And Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu talking to a student. Imagine, what a, what a humiliating way, right? What a humiliating way for my student to go out. This was a talib ilm, a student of knowledge to the one who the Prophet wasallam said, if there was to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar. He was muhaddath, spoken to by the angels. He was a student of him, not a student of Umar Sulaiman or a student of Abdul Nasir, Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jang or Imam Suhaib Web. He was a student of Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar ibn Khattab was heartbroken. So Umar ibn Khattab sat next to his grave and he said, Ya Fata, O oh young man, waliman khafa maqama rabbihi jannatan. And for the one who feared the power of his Lord is two gardens. And the young man spoke from his grave, a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, فَأَجَابِ الْفَتَى قَدْ أَعْطَانِيهَا يَا عُمَرْ مَرَّتَيْنِ Allah has given it to me, O oh, Umar, twice. مَرَّتَيْنِ Some of the scholars, they said twice, because the time he held himself back from the fear of Allah, and then the other time when he was speaking to his father, he got fearful again and he passed out again. Allah gave me four gardens instead of two. Why? I held myself. So if you're in that relationship right now, or if you're thinking about getting in that relationship, or if you think that Allah has created a cover for you so you can do whatever you want, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. Allah is the one who created the cover for you in the first place. But don't lose hope. Even the student of Umar got lost. 
Don't lose hope. Just pick yourself up before it gets worse. Before you end up losing your parents, your reputation, destroying your future prospects of a halal marriage. Get all of that out the way. Stop it now. Yes, you will feel the hurts because you might have developed a true love for that person. This man, when he's talking to Allah, he makes it a point to say to this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala twice, Wahiya ahabun nas ilayya. Oh Allah, I love her. I love her. You know how much I love her. She's the most beloved person to me in the world, but I left her for you. I knew it didn't start on the right foot. And for those of you that are wondering, well, if I'm in this relationship, can't I just make it halal now? Can't I just make it halal now? And I want to tell you that nothing that starts with offending Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will become blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that way. Unless there's a sincere repentance in the, in, the, in the way. Now, what I mean by that, you know, it's, let me put it to you this way. If you were to bring a girl home, or sisters, if you were to bring a brother home, and the first thing that person did was curse your mother out and throw a shoe at her. It doesn't matter how many cards he brings, and how many flowers he brings. You threw a shoe at me. You cursed me out, I remember. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts sincere repentance. But what is sincere repentance at that moment? What is sincere repentance when you're engaged in that relationship? What is it? To leave that relationship. That relationship is a sin. Not to say, oh Allah, I'm in this relationship. Can you make it halal now? That's like, you know, subhanAllah, there's an expression in Arabic that you, know, you, you fix someone's hat and then you slap him and the hat goes to the side and then you try to fix the hat again. You can't do that with Allah Azza wa Jalla, of course. Laysa kamithil hi shay. But I'm saying it's offensive. It's like you would offend a human being. Like I'm still engaged. I'm not willing to leave this haram. So can you make this haram halal for me? No, that's not sincere repentance. Sincere repentance is, I can't talk to you anymore. I know I have love for this person, but look, I can't talk to you anymore. And then while you're alone, oh Allah, forgive me. And then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you, and then maybe later on down the line, after you've really withdrew yourself from that, then maybe it can work out. If it starts off the halal way again, if you come through the front door now, go through the proper channels, go through the proper means, maybe then it will work out. But don't try to, don't try to play that game with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I'll give you a fiqhi a correlation of that. In Islam, zawaj tahleel is haram. Tahleel is basically if a, if, a, if a woman has been divorced three times, a man and a woman were divorced three times, then they cannot be together anymore unless the, unless the woman was to get married and was to become intimate with her husband and then divorce him too. Because that means that that's a woman that probably has some serious issues with marriage. So fine, it wasn't, it wasn't you. It wasn't about the compa- compatibility of you and her or of her and you. It was that, you know, you guys just aren't very good marriage material, so maybe you deserve each other. But in Islam, it's haram for a woman to say, oh, well, I've been divorced three times. Let me go have a paper marriage just so I can say I was married again so I can come back to my old husband and say, hey, we're married again. Why? Because it wasn't real. It's artificial. It's superficial. It's on paper. So for you to have Allah bless your relationship, you need to leave that relationship and you need to seek forgiveness from Allah Repair your relationship with him and repair your relationship with your parents. And then if later on down the line, if when, you're, when, you're, when your mind has become free of those impurities from those thoughts, you think to yourself, that's the best person for me in my deen, then you go through the proper channels. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you all, because it's tough. I know. May Allah help you all, because it's tough. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I really feel for you and I understand that our cultures just suck when it comes to this. Let's face it. But that's Allah testing you a little bit more. Take the test inshallah. And with any test, when you pass the test, it's that much sweeter. It's that much sweeter, wallah. Take you a few more years to get married. But once you get married and that's the only person you've ever shared your secrets with, that's the only person you got close to, it's that much sweeter. It's that much sweeter. It's not Jannah. Because some of you are like, wow, that's Jannah. It's not Jannah. Jannah is even sweeter than that. Because even after you get married, you'll still have issues. Not, with, not necessarily with her. You will have issues with her and you will have issues with him. But life will still be a test. And that's what makes Jannah so sweet. You struggled for it. You toiled for it. 
Jazaa'an bima kuntum ta'malun. This is a reward for that which you used to do. That's what Jannah is. So when you get married, it's a little minor Jannah for the first year. Second year is kind of bad sometimes. No, I'm just playing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to have good, pure, religious spouses, inshallah, who better us in dunya and in deen. Everyone say, Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow our marriages to come in the way of our relationships with our parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow our relationships to come in the way of our relationship with Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst those who love and who hate only for His sake. Allahumma Ameen. Jazakum Allahu khayran. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.